With this, I will start the presentation itself. And what is growth and development? So first, when we look at gene and protein interactions, we have to know what is growth. And growth in itself comprises primarily of two main things, patterning and morphogenesis. But what is patterning? Now, patterning is a division of an embryonic field into distinct territories based on gene expression profiles. And it is not these genetic expression profiles, however, that gives rise to 3D structures or sophisticated structures. It's the process of morphogenesis that gives you complicated and sophisticated structures, such as the limbs, the wings, and the teeth. And morphogenesis in itself causes the local physiological changes in cell shape and size, resulting in magnificent structures such as these. But the question really is to identify the relationships between these genetic profiles and how do they translate in giving you these sophisticated structures. And by doing so, we hope to understand thus the mechanisms that delineate the shape and size of organs, and what are these that delineate, that limit the size of organs, and also to define certain principles and rules in the prospect of designing novel tissues and organs of proper shape and size. And these are essentially vital in the upcoming regenerative medical approaches. Now, the limb in itself serves as an excellent model system to study these processes. So the mesoderm ectodermal interactions, cell migrations, and patterning events are not only restricted to the development of a limb, but also to other developing organs. It's also a great model to see how groups of cells structure themselves and how these structures basically form in the right precise locations along an embryonic axis. So having said this, the limb is an excellent model system. And if you look at the development of the limb in itself, it develops from a very small flank of tissues. And it's fascinating to see how it basically grows into this complicated structure. And all of these happen in a very short yet critical phase of time during embryonic development namely between E9.5 to E13.5. And it's self-mentioned to note that even though the hind limbs and the forelimbs are developing in a very similar fashion, the hind limbs are morphologically delayed by about half a day. So the project itself, however, I will focus mainly on the morphogenesis of the forelimb, which in itself is governed by three main axes, namely the proximal distal axis, or the PD axis, this is basically the axis that defines the shoulder, the proximal part, to the distal, the tip of your fingertips. And you have your dorsal ventral axis, the DD axis, that forms the palm, which is the ventral part, to the back, the back, the, uh, the dorsal part, which is the back of your hands. And of interest, and the axis that I'm interested in, is the anterior posterior axis. Now this is the axis that forms the um, anterior part, which is your digit one, or the thumb, to your posterior part. And this is the axis that gives rise to the number of digits and also the identity of these digits. But what is this anterior-posterior identity? It can be classified in several ways, of which I'm going to list a few. Now, there is a morphological distinction between an anterior and a posterior part of the limb. So the morphological distinction between a digit 1, which is an anterior digit, a thumb, is that it has two phalanges, compared to your posterior digits, which have three phalanges. Now, apart from the morphological distinction, there is also a molecular level distinction in the developing limb. So you have certain genes like PAX9, for example, which are only expressed anteriorly and they are not expressed posteriorly. And other genes like hox 12 which are not expressed anteriorly. So you have genes like Sodic Hedgehog or HAN2, which also only show a posterior bias. So the point here is that certain genes are only expressed anteriorly or posteriorly and they show a bias in the anterior-posterior expression, which also marks a molecular distinction between the anterior and the posterior domain of a developing limb. And also, this is related to a physiological change as well. So you have certain biological activity that's only present anteriorly or posteriorly. And one of this is this anterior apoptotic domain, which is present only in the anterior part of the developing limb, and it's absent in the posterior part of the limb. So having said this, we then form the basis of the morphogenetic process we would like to study. It's really the anterior-posterior morphogenetic processes. But what are the genes we are interested in? So we are interested in to identify the relationship between MSX genes and anterior-posterior morphogenesis. But what are MSX genes? Now, MSX genes in itself, and in the mouse you have MSX1 and MSX2, which are basically expressed globally, and which will be of our interest. 
Um, so in physics one and two, they are expressed in a wide variety of embryonic sites. As you can see during embryonic development of E11.5 to E13.5, you see they are expressed globally in the embryo. And of interest, MSX1 and 2 also show overlapping domains of expression. And they are expressed in the developing part of the developing limb, basically during critical stages of development. And of interest, they are highly conserved homeotomy transcription factors, and they serve mainly as transcription repressors. And I would like to stress that MSX genes are prominently expressed in the limb buds during critical stages of development, as I mentioned, and also in an overlapping fashion, as you see. Now, this is all good and fine, but there is this paradox that MSX poses us. Basically, as I mentioned, MSX genes were expressed both in the forelimbs and in the hindlimbs in an almost symmetrical manner, and also in a very overlapping manner. But what this, but this does not relate when you have mutations in MSX1 and MSX2. So in the double mutants of MSX1 and 2, you have a systematic anterior defect and an anterior polydactyly. So even though they, there is no bias in the expression of these genes in either the anterior or the posterior domain, the defects are concentrated only anteriorly. So this is really the paradox that it poses us, and also it then suggests that MSX interacts thereby with major partners in anterior-posterior patterning to evoke these changes. But how is the anterior-posterior patterning in itself determined? So in a limb, in a nutshell, really, you have the secreted protein sonic hedgehog, which is localized to the posterior margin, and this is really the key player here. It acts as a morphogen down a concentration gradient. So it's expressed in the posterior domain, it goes down a concentration gradient, and it's almost absent in the anterior part of the limb. So it's, the main function of sonic hedgehog is really to, the main idea of sonic hedgehog is really to establish the identity of digits and the number of digits. And the function of sonic hedgehog is to prevent the protolysis of a full form of this transcription factor GLI3A into the truncated form of GLI3R. So because sonic hedgehog is absent anteriorly, this protolysis happens readily without inhibition. And thus, you have high levels of GLI3R in the anterior domain. So the anterior domain is now categorized by high concentrations of GLI3R. And this is also where you have apoptosis taking place. And of interest, the mutants of GLI3, as well as the mutants of MSX1 and 2, have a strong polydactylous phenotype, which is concentrated and